Good morning, church. It is great to see each of you here today on this 26th Sunday after Pentecost. If you're worshiping with us online, we're so delighted that you're here as well. We are near the end of our church calendar year. Um, next Sunday is the last Sunday of our church calendar, um, Christ the King Sunday. Today is in gathering, and perhaps you brought your paper sack or tripped over some when you came in the door this morning. Um, we will be bringing those forward and praying a blessing over them. Our young people have written a litany of thanksgiving, which we, they will offer us during the middle part of the service. I want to share with you a few activities in our announcement leaflet. You can follow along as I highlight a couple things. Today we will have a film um, that's created by Braver Angels entitled A Road Trip Across a Divided America. This is part of our commitment of exploring how we can remember what we actually agree about and to work to build relationships um, for the sake of our shared humanity. So I commend that to you. It was scheduled to be in here, but now North Hall is going to be open after all, so we, the film will be over in Rector's Hall where we have coffee hour and fellowship and time there too. Next week, I hope you'll mark on your calendars the Interfaith Thanksgiving service, which will be held at 4 p.m. Um, at St. Andrews. It's a whole town-wide event and um, is a brief, a brief, I mean, not like a Eucharist or anything, um, just a general prayer service that makes space for people of all faiths to join together. So that'll be next Sunday at 4 p.m. at St. Andrews. Um, also next Sunday, we will begin our angel tree. Um, an opportunity for you to purchase gifts for your children whose mothers are presently incarcerated. Um, lastly, today is our incoming, I mean, our in gathering Sunday, as I mentioned about the food, but it's also the invitation to return your pledge for our work to next year. We rely on all of our members of the congregation to help support the work that we do here together financially. And everybody's little part ends up making the whole. So um, that begins today. And if you need more information about that, you can speak to me after worship. If you didn't get your materials, you should have gotten a card that, with the photo of our church on front and then a regular letter um, a few days later. Um, so I invite you to be a part of that. As we prepare for our worship time, we always take a moment to let the sound settle down. You've been busy today, you got here, congratulations. Um, and I have no idea, but I can imagine what the morning already held within it. So we, we take a moment to let the sound settle down inside of us and outside of us so that we have space to hear and receive what God has to offer us in worship today.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, to you, all At this time, the children are invited to go down with Miss Sue for story time. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. 
I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Christ. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It was only sitting here in church listening to Bonnie read the first lesson and the choir sing so beautifully the song of Hannah that I remembered the sermon I'm not going to preach. So I'll just tell you the highlights. <laughs> This story, 1 Samuel, of Samuel's birth, you might recognize Samuel's name because he is the one that is given to Eli, who is the priest of the temple there, and he's the one that hears God speaking to him as a boy. Uh, that might resonate with you when he shows up by Eli's bed and says, you called me? And Eli said, no, I didn't. Go, go lay down. And it happens three times. The third time, the priest Eli realizes that God is speaking to Samuel. That's that Samuel. That's this Samuel. That's the Samuel. And the other reason I am excited about this story as well is the Song of Hannah is very similar to the Song of Mary. So if you go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and place the Song of Mary beside Hannah's song, um, you will see the similarities. And these were written um, thousands of years in a different time. So it's, it's a real gift um, what the scriptures have to offer us. There's so much. There's just literally no way that it can get covered in a Sunday morning. And we have one lesson we don't even read that's appointed for today. There's just so much available to us as we seek to live this life of faith. So now to the actual sermon. Did you see the last word of today's gospel lesson? Did you notice it? Birth pangs. That will be the beginning of the birth pangs, Jesus says. And I said, birth pangs? Birth pangs indicate that something has been gestating for a while, and now it is time for it to emerge into the world. How in the world, Jesus, does this come before that? Today's gospel reading immediately follows last week's. Jesus is challenging the system of how the world is working and how the religious institution is a part of it. What we read today in Mark chapter 13 is some of the last teaching of Jesus in Mark's gospel, because you see the gospel of Mark is only 16 chapters long, and the last two chapters are really all about his um, trial and his, his crucifixion and his burial. In Mark's gospel, the earliest texts of Mark's gospel don't include the resurrection story. So we are right here at the end of the Gospel of Mark. And it is mind-boggling that Jesus is still saying some of the same things which have always been said. He is reminding them of the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we practice our faith. This is the right practice of it. And our belief, our orthodoxy, our doctrine, it should follow the praxis. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything is directed toward that. Everything we do, everything we believe goes in that direction. That sounds familiar. But when Jesus speaks about this temple being destroyed, it sounds like revolution speak. That's what people were looking for in God's kingdom. They wanted a revolution. They wanted something new to come about for Jesus to lead, an overturning of the government so a new kingdom could be established. And the disciples want to know when this is coming. First comes destruction, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and fires. When those things happen, things fall apart. They are not what they used to be. And Jesus says, this is the beginning of the birth pangs. To which I say, not death? This is the beginning of something being born rather than something ending? How can we tell, becomes our question. How can we tell that we are at the beginning of the birth pangs? God's vision for God's kingdom is that everyone is saved. The only qualification for being included in God's kingdom is a willingness to consent to salvation, a willingness to allow God to be your savior. The love of God is revolutionary. It is God who defines love, not the other way around. And God who is love does tear down systems which dehumanize and destroy creation. Love is a powerful force. So let's unpack this a little. Mark's gospel, you might know, is the first of the gospels to be written. It comes before Matthew or Luke or John. Its estimated date is around 70 of the Common Era. And this date is believed for several reasons, but one of them is because the turmoil in Judea, which led to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, about which Jesus is speaking, seems to have been underway or maybe even completed by the time Mark's gospel is written. Things were not going as the disciples had thought. In fact, many of the disciples were already deceased. In our passage for this morning, which is only three chapters from the end of the gospel, we hear Jesus speak prophetically first. In the first two verses of this 13th chapter, Jesus says, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. I'd like to differentiate between prophecy and fortune-telling or predicting the future, since often people make them synonymous. Prophecy is a moral reflection on the present time. It is saying, this is the path that you're on. You see the end? Repent, which means to turn around if you don't want to go that way, because you are on this road. Prophecy serves as a warning. If you don't change, this is where you're going. The destruction is simply what comes from not heeding the warning. The destruction comes only from not changing course from your current path. That's what a prophet does, calls people in to repent. And this is why I say that our young people, our teenagers, are prophets with a little p. A little p. Not a capital P like Prophet Isaiah or Prophet Elijah or Prophet Elisha or the Prophet Ezekiel or the Prophet Micah. Not a capital P, a little P. They have yet to develop the moral authority to call our society to repent. But in their blessed naivete, and I say this with no irony or sarcasm, in their blessed naivete, in their journey of discovery, they see some of the horrors that we as grown-ups have trained ourselves to ignore. We have learned to just not look over there. And our young people say, uh, do you see where we're going? Look what happens next and next and next. This is what happens when we're with our young people, which is sometimes why people don't want to be around them. They don't want to see. They'd rather ignore it. When our young people raise a concern, when they tell us, this is where we're headed if we continue down this road, I hope, I pray, I want to encourage us to be slow to dismiss them as exaggerating or overly dramatic. Let us listen and discern our repentance and reform. This is what happened in the aftermath of the election when young people said, oh my goodness, what about the environment? 
knowing to some extent what some of the changes would be under Trump's administration, they said, what are we going to do about that? And that is part of the anxiety of this transition. Our young people know what the science says, even when some of us grown-ups say, you know what, everybody's making too big of a deal. But what if we listen to them? What if we allow ourselves to entertain this extreme information that we receive? Where would be the harm in caring for our environment better? Where would be the harm in attending to making changes? Even if it's not going to be as bad as some people say it will be, what would be the harm in actually improving the effort? There's the question our young people ask of us. So prophecy is about a call for repentance and reform. Consider how you have time to change your ways, because this is the path that you're on. And Jesus is saying that to the disciples. Then Jesus addresses the disciples' questions when they say, how will we know that this is happening? And it's tempting for us to read his words as apocalyptic when he talks about wars and rumors of wars and uh, earthquakes and fires. They've been going on for a long time. Um, So if, if you have a little length of time on this earth, you say, well, it was really bad then too. But Jesus' words aren't apocalyptic. They're not apocalyptic for two reasons. One, they don't follow the pattern of apocalyptic writing in Scripture. And another is that apocalypse means to uncover, to reveal. Apocalyptic writing shows us symbols that may then be interpreted to reveal a truth about God, and that's not what Jesus is doing here. There is nothing being revealed in Jesus' words, no truth being made known about how God works. I refer to 2020 as an apocalyptic year, a year of revelation, because all kinds of things were made known to us, whether we wanted to know them or not. All sorts of things were being revealed to us during that year. We started to recognize that economic inequality shapes physical health. Many of us didn't know that or were blind to the extremities of it. We started to recognize that physical contact with other people was necessary for mental health. Oh, actual physical bodies actually help the brain. That was another discovery that we made along the way. But we also saw really hard and horrible divisions in our nation that we wanted to believe weren't there. It was painful and it was scary. And that's informing our reality now. Will that happen again? When we saw protesters be sprayed with tear gas, we say, will that happen again? We never thought we would see that. When we come to know things, we sometimes can be burdened by the knowledge and we want to dig into the sand and put our head down in there where it's safe and warm and quiet. But a life of faith, and Jesus is saying this, follow me because I'm going to help you go through this. You cannot control the way the world works, but you can in following me find your direction, a path toward salvation. In the span of eternal time, we are still in the same moment as 2020. It was only four years ago, and as far as eternity is concerned, that is maybe the blink of an eye. And thus the effort of our part remains the same as we seek to live faithfully in this day. Jesus is instructing the disciples on how they are to conduct themselves in the political and social culture and turmoil of the age. He is telling them, he is telling us, as people who are his followers in the 21st century, that we are to follow him. Whenever and wherever Jesus' followers are found, no matter the decade, no matter the date, they are to direct their efforts so that they might endure through the hardship. They must focus on claiming and proclaiming the love of God in the world. That is the gospel, and that is our task. How do we know love and present love in the world so that people recognize love in the world? This is not about moral scrutiny. None of us need to go out with a clipboard to figure out who's in and who's out, or whether anyone has earned a right to speak. We earn our right by speaking love. We earn our right by proclaiming love, demonstrating love in the world. Our task is to preach the gospel, which is claiming and proclaiming God's love for all creation in this world. Now, if I've been listening accurately, I think I know that most people think the idea of preaching the gospel is terrifying. Just don't make me say anything. I understand, and I'm not going to make you. But I want to invite you into two things which can help God help you 
to find your words when words are necessary, and to find your actions when actions are needed. Two things which we can encourage each other to work on as individuals and collectively as St. Stephen's. Two things which we can encourage one another and which will allow God's love for all to be operative in the world. How do we learn to speak love without an invitation? And how do we learn what to say? I want to touch on both of these things briefly. How do we learn to speak love without an invitation? I like to remember the last time someone has said, would, would you say something, does anybody have anything nice and wonderful to offer in this conversation? Does anybody want to say something about love or how love might fit in with our situation we've got here now? I see some of you smiling because you can't you remember ever hearing that question, right? <laughs> Never have you ever been in a group where someone said, what do you think love has to say about this? Does anybody have an answer? I've only gotten good at praying people because people ask me to do it all the time. Right? So I can do that for you, too. I can ask you to pray all the time. You'll get good at it. How do we learn to speak God's love into the world without an invitation? What would we say if we were asked? And this is something that we can do within the privacy of our own prayer lives. How would I say it? What is it I'm trying to say? What is it that's agitating at me now? What is it that is waking me up in the middle of the night and I want to speak love into this? What would I actually say? Sometimes we're afraid to speak because we'll get it messed up, but there's ways to practice on your own, to do your first draft in the privacy of your own home, whether it be in a journal or in front of your mirror or just talking to yourself in the car. There's ways to practice how you would say love into the world. And when we start to practice it, then we start to discover when it can be said. You see, the next verse in Mark's gospel, which we will not read before we finish with this gospel next week, is about Jesus saying, people are going to call you to account for yourself because of me. Don't worry about what you're going to say, Jesus says. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give you those words. But what the Holy Spirit does is pull those words from you that you already have. And so that is our discipleship, our practice on proclaiming the love of God into the world. You know, I'm teaching this book, um, well, or creating some space for dialogue and encouragement on this book on caring assertiveness. It truly, the whole book is about how do you claim the truth and share it in a way in which other people want to hear it. That end phrase is really pivotal and necessary. <laughs> how do you share it in a way that other people want to hear it? Most of us don't share because we don't want people to ostracize us or to not welcome our words. And many of us don't share because we have been hurt by people telling us the truth in ways that we don't want to hear. So the invitation as, our, as disciples is to say, how do we share it in a way that people would want to hear it? If God is love, how would I say that in a way that they would recognize it? We think about this even in the social issues that we care about as a congregation. When we welcome in the LGBTQ community, they need to hear that they're welcome because unless someone says it, they won't know. So Jesus warns the people as this beginning of the birth pangs happens that some will come and say, I am he, I am the Messiah. He says, don't believe them. You'll recognize the return of the Messiah because the two greatest commandments will be upheld through it all. Yes, there will be suffering, but don't be distracted from the journey of love's work because of the suffering. New life for all is on the other side. We, as Christian people, we believe in the resurrection. New life comes after death. And we believe in birth. New life comes after separation. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Whether in birth or death, the Lord is bringing about something new. The truth is that God defines us. Our circumstances do not define us. God defines us. And we come into this room week after week to remember ourselves. So the question before us is, how do we live within our understanding of ourselves as beloved creatures of God? The social environment does not affirm the value of humanity. We are consumers to the world. We are relied upon for our consumption, and the ads will affirm it. So we cannot look to the economic or social structures of value out in the world to understand our humanity. We must first contemplate the scriptures, 
allow our understanding to influence the way we live, and verify our sense of direction in the tradition of faith which has been passed on to us. This is how we find our way. This is how the disciples have always done it. When we consider the question, how do we live within our understanding of ourselves as beloved of God, the answer is that Jesus will teach us as we allow ourselves to be taught by him. I want to invite you to join in prayer as we finish in this homily today by pulling out your collect for today. It's on the front page at the bottom right column. And we are going to pray these words together, starting with the words, Blessed Lord. We'll pray in unison. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten. The images of cosmic disaster in today's readings fill us with fear, but also with hope. Terrifying as the signs may be, the cosmic time will bring life to those who have been faithful, just, and wise. Aware of the need for a new order, let us pray that God's reign will come in its fullness, saying, may your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of this world that abandoning the terrible power of weaponry, they may trust instead the ways of peace. May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the church 
that it may always be a sign of your loving presence and a sign of hope, even in the darkest times. May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for victims of warfare and natural disasters, that you may comfort them in their suffering. May your reign come. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer from despair, especially young people, that you may give them the courage to build for the future. May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this community of faith, that we may learn to respond to the signs of the times with wisdom and grace. We pray especially for Anne, Tracy, Lowry, Joel, Peter, Claire, Ted, Kathy, and John, and for Charles J. Whedon, in whose name the altar flowers have been given. May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. I invite you to name, either silently or aloud, those for whom you pray. Loving God, giver of life, the town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Munsee Lemapi, and which, which are called Jake people. They were the original stewards of this land on which St. Stephen stands today. We thank them for their strength and their resilience in stewarding this land and we hope to continue their legacy of valuing all of creation. Amen. Amen. As you know our hopes and fears, even before we speak them, hear the prayers of your people. Help us in our struggle to stay alert, that we may be ready for the hour of your coming. We ask this through Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Would you stand, please? The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to turn and share a sign of God's peace.
we invite you to take your seats as we move into our offering and by laying down what we hold on to, we have open hands to receive what God has to offer us. We um, have, as I mentioned before, this is in Gathering Sunday, so the ushers will pass the plates during the offertory um, anthem, as you see here, and then we will bring forward the plates and then also the bags of food. And this is a little, um, it's a little energetic and unorganized, and that's exactly how we like it. So um, people can help go get bags, you bring them up here, there'll be people on the other side of the rail to stack them here. And then after that part, our young people will lead us in a litany of thanksgiving. So as we prepare for what God has to offer us, yet again, we practice letting go so that our hands are open so that we might receive what God has to offer us. Let us hear the words of scripture. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good thy vows unto the Most High.
Please remain standing. In this litany of thanksgiving, we dialogue with Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. We thank you, God, for our homes, for places of safety where we can separate ourselves from the chaos of the world. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. We thank you for feeling safe within our community, for friends and family, for people we can confide in, for friendships, humor, the ability to laugh and play. As the psalmist says, he leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. We thank you, God, for opportunities given, for education, for rest and energy, for mentors, coaches, and teachers, for caffeine, coffee, tea, energy drinks, for injuries, hardships, conflict, challenges, and school lunches, for freedom of speech and freedom of expression, for our ability to move past things and not stay in one place when something bad happens. As the psalmist writes, even in these hard times, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We thank you for food which nourishes and delights us, such as chocolate, pizza, mac and cheese, pasta, sushi, cookies, English bacon, soup, maple syrup, ice cream, French toast, tacos, nachos, chipotle, Welsh cakes, orangia, bagels, cereal, fruity pebbles. We thank you for our health bodies which work for doctors, dentists, insurance. You appoint my head of oil, my cup overflows. We thank you for liberty, equality, fraternity. We f for stories which help us find ourselves awakening to your presence. We thank you for organizations which helps us work across differences, the United Nations, European Union, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and aligned ships of other countries. For the American Red Cross, kind people, people who care. For Pinterest and other social media, which help us connect with people, break down barriers, and help people. For public transportation, cars, material things that help us, appliances, investments, for the government, people and leadership, for labor unions and the armed forces, for our interconnectedness and reliance on one another, we have more than enough. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We thank you for clean water, for creation, the seasons, for the ocean, for dogs, cats, coral reefs, everglades, wetlands, variety of animals, for trees, including the hunt including the 200-year-old ginkgo, which is on our campus, second oldest in the state of Connecticut, for air, oxygen, and weather. 
We thank you for being the Holy Trinity of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, always in relationship, for history and tradition, for art and music, and the ability for expression, for the communion of saints, for your mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We thank you for the primacy of love in the name of the one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace, you looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet, we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with Stephen and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. 
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who are conscious of your failure, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here, sustaining us for the life we are called to in him. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.